I want to give my talk with a story. It's late 2014. Your company is launching a revolutionary new social network. Wisely, your team has chosen Go as the language to implement this. And you have been tasked with writing the crucial server component. Possibly it looks a little like this. It should be fairly uncontroversial to anybody in the room. There's some unexported fields that need to be initialized, and we need to start a Go routine to handle all the requests. The package has got a pretty simple API. It's pretty easy to use. But there is a problem. Soon after you announce your first beta, the feature requests start to roll in. Mobile clients are often slow to respond, or they don't respond altogether. And you need to add support for disconnecting these slow clients. And in this climate of heightened security awareness, your bug tracker starts to fill up with people who are complaining about your lack of support for TLS. Then you get a report from a user who's running your server on a very small VPS. And they can't, they can't manage the number of connections. They need to have a way to limit the number of simultaneous connections. Next is the request to rate limit concurrent connections from a group of users who are being attacked by a botnet. And, and on it goes. So now you need to make a change to your API to somehow incorporate these feature requests. So it's probably not a good thing that this doesn't really fit on the slide. Can I have a show of hands? Like, who's, who's used an API like this? Keep a hand up if you're one who's written an API like this. And most importantly, who's had their code break because they depend on an API like this? So obviously, this solution is cumbersome and it's brittle. And it isn't very discoverable. Newcomers of your package, they have no way of telling which of the parameters are mandatory and which are optional. For example, if I want to create uh, a testing version of this server, uh, do I need to provide a TLS certificate? And if I don't, what do I use instead? Um, if I don't care about maximum connections or maximum concurrent, uh, what value do I use? I don't know, maybe I put zero there. Zero sounds reasonable, but depending on how the feature was implemented, uh, that might actually limit you to zero concurrent connections altogether. And so it appears to me that writing an API like this is easy as long as you make it the caller's responsibility to get it right. And while, well, while this example could be considered an exaggeration, I mean, it's maliciously constructed, it's poorly documented, I believe that it demonstrates a real problem with brittle APIs like this. So now I, I think I've defined the problem. I want to look at some of the solutions to this. So rather than trying to provide that's one single function that must cater for every possible permutation. One solution might be to, to create a set of functions. And with this approach, when the caller wants a secure server, they can call the TLS variant. And when they want to establish a maximum duration for clients, they can call the, t the timeout variant. Unfortunately, as you can see, providing every possible permutation can quickly become overwhelming. So let's move on to some other ways of making your API configurable. So a really common solution is to use a configuration struct. And this has some, some nice advantages. Using this approach, the configuration construct can grow over time as new options are added, while the public API uh, stays the same. This method can also lead to better documentation. What used to be a really big block comment now becomes nice Godoc on the fields of that configuration structure. And potentially it also enables callers to use the zero value to signify that they just want you to choose the default. However, this, this pattern isn't perfect. It has trouble with defaults, especially if that zero value has a well understood meaning. For example, in the configuration structure here, when port is not provided, the new server function is going to return a server that listens on port 8080. But this is a real downside, that now you can no longer explicitly set port to zero and have the operating system choose for us an ephemeral port. 
to listen on, because there's no way to tell that explicit zero that you set from the field's default, the field zero value. So most of the time, users of our API will be expecting the default behavior. But even though they have, do not intend to change any of the configuration, those calls are still required to pass something for that second argument. So when people read your tests, they read your example code, trying to figure out how your package works, they're going to see that magic empty value. And it's going to be enshrined in their collective unconsciousness. And to me, this just feels wrong. Why should users of your API have to construct an empty value simply to satisfy the signature of the function? A common solution to this empty value problem is to pass a pointer to the value instead, thereby enabling callers to use nil rather than constru constructing an empty value. And it's my opinion that this pattern has all the problems of the previous example, and it adds a few more. We still have to pass something for the function's second argument. But now that could be nil. And most of the time it will be nil for those that just want the default behavior. And it raises questions. Is there a difference between passing nil and explicitly creating an empty value and passing a pointer to it? And, and more concerning for both the package's author and the people using that package is that this configuration value is now retained by both the caller and what it's passed into. And that gives rise to questions of what happens if that config struct is mutated after we pass it to new, to new server. So I believe that well-written APIs should not require the caller to create these dummy values to satisfy those rare use cases. I believe that we, as Go programmers, should work hard to ensure that nil is never a parameter that needs to be passed to a public API. And when we do want to pass configuration information, it should be as self-explanatory and expressive as possible. So now with these points in mind, I want to talk about what I think are some better solutions for this problem. To remove the problem of that mandatory, but frequently unused, configuration value, we can change the new server function to accept a variable number of arguments. Instead of passing nil, or some zero value, as a signal that you want the defaults. The variadic nature of this function means that you don't need to pass anything at all. And in my book, this solves two really big problems. First, the invocation for the default behavior becomes as concise as possible. And secondly, new server can now accept config values, not pointers to config values. And that removes nil as a possible argument and ensures that the caller cannot retain a reference to the server's internal configuration. And I think that's a really big improvement. But if we're being pedantic, it still has a few problems. Obviously, there's the expectation that you as the caller are only going to pass one config value. But the, because the function signal is very attic, the implementation has to be written to cope with the caller passing multiple values that could possibly be contradictory. Uh, so is there a way to use a variadic function signature and improve the expressiveness of configuration parameters when we need them? And I, I think that there is. So at this point, I want to make it really clear that the idea of functional options comes from a blog post titled Self-Referential Functions and Design, written by Rob Pike in January this year. I really encourage everyone to go out and read it after this. So the key difference from the previous example, and in fact, all of the examples I've pre presented so far, is customization of the survey is performed not with configuration parameters stored in a structure, but with functions which operate on the server value itself. As before, the variadic nature of the function signature gives us the compact behavior we want for the default case. And when configuration is required, I pass new server functions which operate on the server value itself. The timeout function simply changes the timeout field of any server value passed into it. And if you look a little bit further down, 
The TLS function is a little bit more complicated. So it takes the server value and it wraps the original listener value inside a TLS listener and puts that back into the server field, thereby con converting an insecure server into a secure server. So inside new server, applying these options is really straightforward. After we open a TCP listener, we declare a server instance using that listener. Then for each option function passed into new server, we call that function, passing in a point of that server value that we just declared. Now obviously, if no options functions are provided, there's no work to do in that loop. And so the server value remains its default, unchanged. And that really is all there is to it. Using this pattern, we can make an API that has sensible defaults, it's highly configurable, can grow over time, it's self-documenting, it's safe and discoverable for newcomers, and most importantly, it never requires nil or an empty value just to keep the compiler happy. I'm going to talk about how I applied this pattern to a package that I wrote a while back and show how I believe it's improved it. I, I'm an amateur hardware hacker. Many of the devices that I work with uh, have a serial interface over USB. So a few months ago, I wrote myself a terminal handling package. So in this prior version, to open the serial device, change that speed, and then set it into raw mode, you'd have to do each of these steps individually, checking the error at every stage. And even though this package is trying to provide a friendlier interface to an even lower level interface, it still left too many procedural warts for the user to deal with. So let's have a look at how the package looks once I've applied this functional option pattern. By converting the open function to use a variadic parameter of function values, we get a much cleaner API. In fact, it's not just the open API that's improved. But that grind of setting an option, checking the error, setting the next one, checking the error, that's all just gone. The default case still just takes one argument, just the name of the device. And for more complicated cases, configuration functions are defined in the term package and are passed into the open function and are applied in the order in which, which they are specified in the source. So this is the same pattern as we saw in the previous example. The only thing that's really different is that uh, the functions, rather than being anonymous, these are public functions, um, but in all other respects, they operate exactly the same. So we'll take a look at how speed, raw mode, and open work on the next slide. So raw mode is the easiest to explain. It's just a function whose signature is compatible with open. Because raw mode is declared in the same package as the term type, it can access the private fields and private methods declared on that type. And in this case, it's just calling that private set broad mode helper. Speed is also just a regular function. However, it does not match the signature open requires. And this is because speed itself requires an argument, the board rate. So speed returns an anonymous function, which is compatible with open's function signature, which closes over the board rate parameter, capturing it for being applied later. So inside the call to open, first open that terminal device. Then, just as before, we range over that slice of options functions that were provided, calling each one in turn, passing in T, which is our pointer to the term value. And if there's an error applying any of these functions, then we just stop at that point. Clean up, return, like close the terminal device, and return the error to the caller. Otherwise, returning from that function, we've now created and configured a term value to the caller's exact specifications. So in summary, functional options let you write an API that can grow over time. They enable the default use case to be as simple as it can be. They give meaningful names to your configuration parameters. And finally, and probably the most important, they give you access to the entire power of the language to initialize these complex variables 
rather than relaying that information through a, through a dead structure. So I've presented many of the existing configuration patterns as part of this talk. And many of these are considered idiomatic and in common use today. And at every stage, I've stopped to ask questions like, can this be made simpler? Is that parameter really necessary? Does the signature of this function make it easy for it to be used? Is it safe? Does that API contain traps or confusing misdirection that will frustrate people trying to use it for the first time? And my hope is that I've inspired you to do the same, to revisit code that you've written in the past and pose yourself these same questions and thereby hopefully improve it. Thank you.